So thank you very much. It's uh, obviously a difficult job to be here and not be one of the smartest people in the room, uh, but I'll do my best. I'll start off by saying that I am not an engineer. I'm not technically inclined. All I know how to do is juggle numbers and talk to people. So why are you here? Why are you listening to making the market for carbon removals? Isn't this just very clear? Carbon removals doesn't need any market making. It's just something that we all do. Um, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, but for, before I get into what we are doing at South Pole related to making the market for particularly technical carbon removals, I just want to take you back a little bit and talk a little bit about why this matters from, from, from a global context. Um, so as you probably are all aware, you know, we have these, these pathways that we're trying to meet in order to stick to the Paris Agreement, uh, to manage the amount of car global warming we have, to ensure that we have a sustainable world. As you can see, this is a graphic which shows you know, we have a very, very short period of time in order to stick to that 1.5 target that Paris is asking for. In fact, if you look at the recent IPCC report, they're saying we have to reach peak emissions by 2025. We are in very real jeopardy of, of reaching those, and what is going to happen if we don't mitigate our, our, our global warming is that all stakeholders, uh, people, voters, customers, are all going to be impacted. Just to give it some context, because I always struggle with this, what does all these numbers mean? I mean, we talk about PPM and, and how much carbon is in the atmosphere, but I just want to kind of put it into to some granularity here. If we, don't, if we reach 2% warming, we're going to have a decade, uh, once in a decade heat wave every two years. We're going to have crop, once in a decade crop failure every four years. And we're going to have massive rain and snowfall. Right now, um, in terms of financial flows, we are well, well short of where we need to be in order to reach 2.5. Um, and so as stakeholders here, you should be aware that governments, we can expect, and regulators, will start to recognize this and may put pressure on companies to manage their, their carbon emissions. So reality check, how are we doing? I just want to show you three graphs, three pictures here. This is um, uh, heat waves, um, wildfires, and on the left we have precipitation. This is if we ha achieve 2.5 degrees warming. Where are we? 2.7 to 3.2. And at those sorts of levels, what we can expect is that we are going to be making much of the Earth inhabitable. Our pathways right now are not sufficient in order to achieve the Paris Agreement. So we can expect more flooding, more droughts and wildfires, less food, more hardship, economic migration uh, as a consequence. Um, basically, we are living in an unsustainable way, and we need to take action now in order to achieve it. So before I get into this a little more, I just want to kind of clarify what carbon removals are, because I have a lot of conversations with people who say, carbon removals, this is when you like buy carbon offsets and so forth. Not quite. Carbon avoidance and carbon reduction are carbon offsets. These are things like implementing a solar power plant instead of using coal-fired power. This is reducing the amount of emissions that you have. Effectively, what offsets do is they compensate for emissions and allow you to make climate neutral claims. Carbon dioxide removals are slightly different. What we're actually doing is storing, removing and storing carbon, effectively creating a negative emission. And what this negative emission allows you to do is then meet your net zero claims. So they are very different uh, terminologies, and they reflect different things. Uh, many of you will be aware of why we need carbon removals. So as you can see, we have a, a chart here which shows business as usual performance. Um, we have the blue piece, which reflects companies, people reducing their emissions load. But as you can see, at the end of the tail there, it's very, very difficult to get part of that emissions reduced to net zero. And so what we need to do is actually we have to have negative emissions to offset any of the emissions that we are building up until we hit peak emissions and then moving forward to ensure that we can maintain a stable climate. Um, but, as, we, as I mentioned before, we are very unlikely to hit 1.5 at the moment. Uh, governments 
have, will have emissions moving forward that they need to offset, and so they will also need negative emissions. And I heard before a, sustain, a science based targets initiative, which has been a, a major driver for the companies that we're talking to, um, is providing guidance in terms of what is required to be net zero. And they have said offsets are not enough, avoidance reduction is not enough. You should be doing that anyway. If you want to claim net zero, you need to buy removals. Which brings me to the market of where I'm focused on, which is the market for technical carbon removals. Um, we have a lot of very positive signals. You'll see you know, Wall Street Journal's writing, Wired, Economist, are all saying you know, this is good. We have the X Prize coming out with $100 million for, for technical removals. We have various different policies which are providing funding for carbon capture and removal. Climaworks was mentioned before. A Swiss-based company raised $650 million to pull carbon out of the air. Uh, I was in Davos a few weeks ago. We were part of the First Movers Coalition launch, which is 50 multinational companies getting together, $8.5 trillion in market cap, who are all saying, you know, we really need to make an impact here. Um, and there's other regulation as well, which is providing those regu in regulatory incentives. However, technical removals are a very, very, very small fraction of what we have today. There's very limited liquidity, there's very little transaction out there, and that's what South Pole decided that we wanted to try and address and achieve uh, by helping to create a market for technical carbon removals. What about nature-based solutions, you say? What about trees? Uh, that's the common hook. We already have the solution for removals. We'll just plant a bunch of trees. Trees are great. We need trees. This isn't a discussion between nature-based solutions and technical removal solutions. This is a discussion about getting nature-based solutions out there and getting technical solutions out there. And it's worth noting that although nature-based solutions are readily available now, or more readily available, supply is fairly limited, to be honest, right now, uh, and more affordable relative to technical carbon removal, uh, the problem is that it does require a lot of land, there are resource requirements, and you can't just plant a tree or any type of tree anywhere, right? So, for example, you could plant trees up in Siberia, which would actually melt the ice up there. You would need three versions of the United States covered in trees in order to mitigate and, and ma maintain 1.5 degree warming. Um, uh, in all, basically, you'd need f three, three versions of the United States planted with trees, and you'd have to replace all that agricultural land. You'd have to provide all the infrastructure in order to achieve it if we only wanted to use nature-based solutions. So technical solutions have to be part of the problem. You also have the issue with nature-based solutions that there is a potential for reversal of the sequestration and the scalability. It takes time to do this. Um, so how do we get the market to grow? So we're addressing the four key barriers to the market. We're looking at the supply side, where this removal is coming from. We're looking at the price. So right now, prices are through the roof, right, for many of these tech technologies. So how do we actually make this at a, at a cost that's affordable and create demand? We have to make sure it's bankable, right? So for you as the startups out here in the room, you need to ensure that if you have a contract, you can go to your bank and actually get financing against that. Um, and this is an important point. We also need to push for different types of standardization in the market and verification. We sure handled it by certification in order to ensure that everyone knows what we're talking about when we buy a carbon removal, that it has the same equivalency across different types. So how did we address that? We created the next gen CDR facility with five large multinationals, Boston Consulting Group, LGT, Mitsubishi uh, OSK Lines, which is a shipping company out of Japan, Swiss Re, uh, and UBS. Five different companies across four countries and three continents. We think this is important to, to signify to the market that this is, we, need, we need a broad coalition. Um, we are working with Mitsubishi on this. Uh, we launched at uh, NextGen, uh, sorry, at the World Economic Forum, a few weeks ago, and what we are planning to do is hit a million tons of removals by 2025. We think we need action now, and we need to start contracting. One key differentiator between what we're doing and what some of the others are doing out there in the market right now is we are going to ensure that every project is certified uh, to ensure that we have that third-party verification that we're doing what we're saying we're doing. And we're going to be ensuring that we're focusing on technologies that can store removals for over a thousand years. So this is basically what we're doing. We've created a, a large purchasing pool for, a crop for bringing in different types of technology companies, using our economies of scale and our expertise in the carbon market to create um, a, in, in, uh, attractive propositions for a series of buyers. We are working across five different technologies that we're looking at. 
uh, biochar, biomass carbon removal and storage, direct air capture, enhanced weathering, which is an interesting one, sprinkling silicate rock uh, to enhance uh, sequestration potential, as well as in product mineralization, so embedding carbon in materials. Finally, um, we are we are working with a multi-stakeholder group to ensure that we have credibility in terms of creating the standards uh, that these uh, initiatives will be monitored on. Um, so you'll see Vera is involved with this. They are a standards body for the voluntary carbon market, and we're using actual data from actual projects to ensure that we're creating robust frameworks. So finally, I'll just I just wanted to summarize with a couple of points. More than a couple, I suppose. Um, but basically, we need technical removals along with nature-based solutions. Uh, we need to create that ecosystem. Otherwise, this is not going to fly as a market. Uh, we need to get that finance and investment moving today by cultivating supply and demand. That standardization piece is a critical one that we'll see increasingly as the market continues to grow. Um, and then a final point for any government officials in the room, I'd love to see some removal targets because that will create the incentives for companies to increase their activity in the space. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Philip. I appreciate it. We've actually got some questions for you Great. before we release you to talk to people. I love the energy outside. Please use the opportunity to network and meet with people. Uh, at this particular conference, it's great that speakers are sticking around. So do grab the opportunity to meet them and talk to them. But we have some questions that I think are also valid for everybody here. So. Can you please clarify the difference between carbon neutral and net zero? Okay. Well, I mean, if you saw the slides before, effectively carbon neutral is basically offsetting, compensating for the emissions that you create. Net zero is basically ensuring that the amount that you are emitting is equivalent to zero. So if you emit, so for example, carbon neutral, you could reduce the amount of emissions you have from two tons to one ton. Right, that would constitute a, reduc a, a reduction in the amount of emissions that you would, you would have. However, you're still emitting that one ton, right? So you're selling that one ton of reduction to somebody else who is, who is actually emitting that ton. You're not actually take, making sure that that emission never happens. It just is offset by a reduction by somebody else. Net zero is saying, if I have a ton of emissions here, I need to take it away somewhere else so that on balance, I have no, no net emissions going into the atmosphere. Next question. Does a regenerative carbon approach exist? Regenerative carbon approach exists. There are a multiple, multitude of different approaches to, to um, carbon removal. Um, I think what we're talking about here is in the agricultural space in terms of uh, sequestering carbon. Mm -hmm. It does exist. It, it, there are certain challenges associated with it. For, for example, um, if you look at soil-based carbon, uh, as long as the, carbon, the, the soil is not disturbed, you can maintain that, that carbon sequestration in there. As soon as you start tilling up the soil, you release some of those emissions into the atmosphere. So one of the ways that we're trying to address that is through the use of high temperature biochar. And we're looking at biochar generated at over 450 degrees because the carbon sequestered in that biochar is retained for a much longer period of time than other types of, uh, of biochar. Do you consider CCS as carbon removal? Carbon capture and storage. Um, so I think we have to differentiate, and this is where the terminology gets mixed up, um, carbon capture removal and carbon storage are, are, are somewhat different. It really depends on, on the source. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're talking about car capturing from, from, from a fossil fuel-based um, situation, then we wouldn't be considering that as, as removal because you're actually generating those emissions. If you're talking about biomass, where that biomass has already captured the carbon, then yes, that would be removal because you're basically ca making sure that those emissions are stored permanently. I've got one last question here. What happens with the carbon stored after a thousand years? That's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we don't know because we haven't uh, done it yet. Um, the, those storage approaches are, 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 are come across a variety of different uh, mechanisms. So I think the most popular one or the one that's most visible right now is converting it into stone. And I've been told that unless there's a volcano, those stones will retain the carbon dioxide. There's also um, conversion into, into liquids and so forth. Um, we say a thousand plus years, it's, it's basically shorthand for saying this is a very long uh, permanence period. We, we can't know what's going to happen beyond a thousand years at the moment, unfortunately. 